Welcome back, everybody. I am Mark Fernandez, and today I am joined by the one and the only Tim Russ. And anybody who follows me and knows my fandom knows that Tuvok is essentially probably my favorite character in all of Star Trek. So this is a huge honor for me, Tim. Thank you very much for doing this. How are you today, sir? Doing fine, man. Doing fine. Thank you. Cool, man. And, and just out of curiosity, Tim, where in the world am I finding you uh, currently? Uh, you mean as far as where I live? Or yeah. West, West Hollywood, California. Oh, nice, nice. That's where I used to live. Uh, yeah. When I, when, when I just le I, I, um, I left California at the end of 2020 after um, I sold my um, uh, last media business. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know what? Like, I like California, but um, I'm originally from Florida. So I yeah. decided to move back to Florida. There you, you know, go. And try right. that out. That's why you can't see anything. There's too much sunlight coming in through the window. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's so, 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 Tim, you know, one, one thing that I've always been very intrigued by, and I'd love to just jump right into it, is to me, Tuvok, um, and look, obviously, you know, you have 30, you know, 30 plus years worth of experience, and, and we can go all over the place. But Tuvok, to me, number one, he was the first real Vulcan that, that we ever got, right? There was no half human, half Vulcan. He's 100% Vulcan. But to me, the thing that, that I always loved about Tuvok was how you portrayed him with this immense amount of, of discipline uh, to who he was and what his uh, uh, sort of code of, of ethics was. Do you account some of this to sort of growing up in a military family? I know that your uh, father was in the Air Force and you kind of were a little bit of an you know, Air Force brat growing up. Did, did that kind of upbringing sort of give you a lot of the sort of foundational DNA that you put inside of Tuvok's brain? Well, um, in, in part, I think the other part uh, of that might might just be uh, my DNA. It just might be my personality. You know, <laughs> I, I might share a few of the traits that that character has, and uh, you know, in my own personality. But yeah, um, you know, the military. You, the main thing the military contributed to was just my going into the the business in the first place. I think that mm. there might have been a, a there are some parallels and similarities to uh, growing up as a, as a military brat um, and, and actually going in and working in this type of business. And a lot of military brats actually ended up in entertainment. You know so, what? I've never made that connection before. What what would you attribute that to? You attribute it to uh, <clears throat> number one, there is sort of an insecurity when you're growing up uh, as a military brat, because you don't know, you don't know what's around the corner. You don't know what's coming hmm. in the next year or two. You're never in one place more than a couple of years. You're always on the move. And uh, so you don't know what's coming next. So your whole life changes hmm. very dramatically uh, overnight. And uh, that's the way that this business is. Interesting. You, you don't know what's coming. Uh, your whole life can change overnight. Um, you, you, uh, also, uh, you make friends in the military, at least when I was growing up. Um, and once you moved or they moved, you lost contact with them. So you came very close to with them and then you lost contact. When you work on a project, you get very close with the actors and then you leave and you never see them again. Sure. And, uh, it's the same pattern. Um, and, you know, and consequently, I think, you know, the, the, the time, uh, I mean, nowadays it's a little different with social media, but but certainly at that time when I was growing up, it was very much, you know, you were doing things and all of a sudden you're cut off. And uh, that unpredictability is part of the business. Mm. You don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. I've had gigs come in on, on a Saturday that I booked and I had to be on a plane on <laughs> right, on Monday, rather, you know, in two days to go someplace to work for seven weeks. Sure. You know, um, and you literally just threw stuff in a suitcase, got it ready, and just took off. I mean, it's that's the way this business is. That's exactly how I grew up. It was the oh, same wow. thing, you know. Um, you being in, living in one place, and all of a sudden, dad comes home and says, "No, we got to move to such and such." And you know, in a month, we're packed up and we're out of there. So that's kind of how this, um, you know, the, the similarity between the two. So I think that. One lent itself to the other. And, and also, you know, you have to be physically uh, right for the character. You mm -hmm. have to, uh, uh, you know, I, if I was five foot three and shaped like a bowling ball and mm -hmm. had a dialect, you know, um, 
I probably would not have gotten the part because right. I would not have been physically right for the role. I was physically right for the role. Right, right. And, and how did you, like at a young age, how did you start to realize that a like a career in acting was something that, that, that you were interested in? Oh, I, I studied it. I took a class in high school and uh, in my teens, and then I went to pursue it in college. So mm. it's about that time when I started and, and, uh, and I studied for four or five years and then eventually came out to uh, LA. So I started in my teens, became interested in, and I did some stage work at that age and, uh, and I really enjoyed it a lot. So uh, my training and background was mostly live stage theater and then eventually got to doing film and television uh, after I moved here. And do you uh, do you still pursue the uh, live stage uh, component of, uh, of, of your acting uh, career a little bit? Yeah, when I can. Yeah, mm -hmm. when, when, when I can, I try to, uh, to work on some stage. I've done some shows here, uh, and I've enjoyed them a great deal, um, but not nearly as much as... Um, as I, as I do film and television. So it's uh, it's very difficult to carve out a big chunk of time like that for a stage play when, you know, uh, offers and work opportunities come in for, you know, money that, you know, I've got to use to pay for medical benefits at the end of the year. I mean, I have, sure. to, take, I have to take one over the other. So typically it's it's very difficult to, to work on stage at this point. How, how would you sort of distinguish um, the effort sort of psychologically between preparing yourself for a film and television role versus a stage role? Like, like how did you kind of prepare your, ba your, your brain differently for the two things? Well, the stage is, you know, hands-on and it's live. So you're going to work with the director and you are moving through a continuous piece um, on stage. And stage, you're, you, you're spending a lot more time typically uh, with that character. Um, mm. And um, um, if, if it's a film that you have a lead role in and you're shooting over a long period of time, first of all, a lot of times it's out of sync. It's in pieces. It's all done uh, uh, out, of, out, of, uh, out of sequence. So mm. you, it, it, in a stage play, everything runs from beginning to end. So if you start the scene or the act, it's going to run all the way through without stopping. So when you're preparing for all of that, Generally, the process for finding the character and, and, and working on the character uh, in stage is, is more detailed, mm. it's more involved. Um, you have times to, as my buddy says, you, you have time to torture it, as it were. You can really, <laughs> right, right. You can, you can really work it, let it simmer. Uh, the director's working with you to help find all the beats and the moments. And, and, it's, and you're preparing for a live performance, and it's just a... It's a flow. It's like it's like doing a continuous piece. Whereas film and television, you have to kind of find that character and put that character together together remotely before mm. you start working. And then when you are working, you only have a limited amount of time to actually get that character on camera, and you have a limited amount of time. You have you're out of sequence, so you don't you don't have a, t a chance to, to make it flow from one point to another. You are taking a chunk of that flow and doing it out of context. Mm -hmm. And yet it has to make sense on the front end and the back end of that scene because it has to be cut into other scenes in sequence. Mm -hmm. So, you know, most of the time you're not lucky enough to shoot a film in sequence um, because of the locations, availability, other actors, etc. So you're nine times out of 10, you're going to be shooting these scenes in a part of the movie and part of the story where you have to, you have to, you have to create, you have to come into that scene in the same mindset and character level as where you left the previous scene, mm. you know, and, and that's the, the trick with working in, in film and television. Everything is done in pieces and they're out of context and out of sequence. So your prep is different. Is there is there any what 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 kind of memorization techniques do you use when you're trying to remember a huge amount of like a dialogue in the context of a play or in the context of of on screen? Um, that's one thing that I find a lot of young actors don't really realize how much effort 
is is involved in the sort of memorization part of it. Do you have any specific techniques or how did you kind of ramp your brain up to sort of get good at that? Oh, I was just, mine is, it's just repetition. I don't have a mm -hmm. photographic memory. I wish I did because it would make this job a lot easier. But <laughs> it's just repetition. One, It's like listening to a song over and over again. You're going to eventually sure. memorize the lyrics and you're going to be able to sing along with the song. Right. It's just simple repetition. I, I, I rehearse, I rehearse, I rehearse. I walk the block with the headphones on and I'll usually give myself the cue lines recorded and then i'll go ahead and fill in the gaps with my lines and mm. eventually you you're gonna learn it you know because you, you, you're gonna do it a hundred times so you know, if for me that's basically what it takes i have pretty good short-term memory it's not bad um but i prefer to get stuff down in uh, long-term memory before i work on it well, if i have to do it short term i will but um it's better to have it long term. And so I, I try to work it and get it really solid mm. uh, prior to actually working. And it's just repetition. You know, for me, it's repetition. There's no other way. There's also if you have if you have dialogue that's written well, it's easier to memorize. If mm. it's uh, phrasing and key issues like that, just a phrasing or grammatic stuff. I, if I can make a change in those lines to make it easier for me to remember them, uh, then I'll do that. Um, if the producers and the writers or director don't mind me doing it. Um, yeah. I'll make a few minor changes. If it's a speech, a big long speech that's telling a story or something in sequence, I'll make sure that I can, if, if there's something that sticks out that's not catching, it's not sticking, I'll change it, see if I can change it. So it makes it easier to, so, so it flows a little simpler and easier and intuitive. Um, so I do that on occasion, but mostly just learning them is just repetition for me. Sure. You know, your, your role in the sci-fi world is is so interesting because a it's you've been around it for a very very long time there's this great interview that you gave years ago where you're like you know you have 35 years of experience in acting and you're and you'll always be remembered for the one line um in space balls you know i ain't found a you know we ain't found a damn thing or whatever the line is um which which is not the case for me but you know definitely i can see like like the humor in that but the beauty that you've been around since those days and uh, involved in Star Trek at almost every iteration, right? Like the movies, the, you know, the next generation. Um, I believe you skipped over DS9, but then obviously, you know, uh, you know, uh, Voyager. Um, how, how did you, when, when did you first land that gig um, on Spaceballs? Was that something where you got to like hang out with Mel Brooks or, or, or was that much more like one, you know, because it was a small role, one, one in a hundred type of thing? No, no, it, uh, uh, Spaceballs uh, came as a result of uh, actually a play that I was doing at the time. Oh, cool. When I first got to town, I did a couple of plays, and he came to see it, and he liked my performance. Oh, that's cool. And he asked my agent if I would come and do this uh, bit on Spaceballs. <laughs> and uh, I thought it was, it was very cool to be able to work on Spaceballs with Mel Brooks. It was uh, at the time, that just because he was Mel Brooks. And... Um, but I just had that one scene we shot and we, and I left and it was very short <laughs> and, and I didn't think anything about it after that. It was just, a but then it, you know, 25, 30 years later, it becomes a big iconic uh, classic. So I, I, you know, that, that was simply a result of doing a, a play mm. in town where a producer came, saw your work and then decided to cast you. And that's what I tell young actors who are starting out. I said, do some live theater when you get a chance to, because right. You know, first of all, it's like an acting class that's free. Um, and uh, and then second of all, you know, you invite people to come see you and your actors that are in cast are also inviting people to come see them and they can see you. Right, it's so like a showcase. You, yeah, now it's a showcase. And you don't know what can come from that showcase. Somebody can see you who's casting a film right then and there. Right. And say, right. Wow, they would be perfect for A, B, C, D. You never know because this is, it's 100% random and, and, and it's uh, it's unpredictable. Um, I did actually work on DS9. I did a Deep Space Nine prior to doing Voyager. I played a Klingon on that show. And I also oh, did. That's right. That's right. I also, yep. I also did a, a mirror episode while I was doing Voyager. I did another Deep Space Nine episode. I think I did two of them. Oh, wow. Wow. So then you touched them all. You you were. All of them. Every one of them. Yeah. Just about. Um, I didn't do Generations. That's the only one I didn't do. And what, how did you, um, because. So then is your first appearance where you play 
the ensign on Sulu ship in uh, undiscovered country. Was that was that your first Star Trek gig? No, no. Uh, the ensign on uh, on oh, and you're talking about generations. I did the feature film Generations. Uh, was it, it was, but you it, also did it, the undiscovered country, right? Part six. Nope. Nope. That was uh, that scene we recreated with Sulu was for flashback on Voyager. Oh, that's right. And so the Voyager. one that you're in is is generations. It's the one generations. Gotcha. With, uh, gotcha. Yeah, with uh, Shatner and Dewan, James Dewan, Koenig. That's, yeah, that's awesome. But this is prior to you being in Voyager. So, so you, so you got into the Star Trek family early. Yeah. And you, and you sort of stayed in the Rolodex? Did you have a relationship with, yep. you know, with, yep. with like, with like exactly. um, Rick Berman and that's stuff it. like that? That's all it was. That's all it was. And I wasn't the only one. They, they've used actors over and over on those shows many times. Yeah, 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 sure. You know, and it's the same thing with any other, you know, um, stuff that I've directed. I have favorite actors that I call all the time. You know, yeah, yeah, they're yeah. available. I call them because I know they're right for the role. And I know I've already worked with them and I like them. So... Uh, Tarantino does it. Um, uh, uh, who is it uh, uh, that did, did uh, Nightmare Before Christmas? So, um, Tim Burton. Tim Burton does it. Yeah, uh, yeah. I just watched another movie last night that somebody had done. They use this. They use the actors that they like. Uh, uh, what is it? Uh, Jordan Peele uses. Uh, right, right. Very well, everybody that we tend to use the people that we like and that we worked with before. They turn in a, a great performance and they're easy to work with and you, you could, they're reliable, you know them already. So there was always going to be a handful of people and it was the same thing with Voyager, same thing with uh, those producers. I've worked on, um, I think, one or two uh, NCIS. I might have done two of those. Mm -hmm. I've done a couple of TV shows that I've worked on more than once um, because they just want to bring me back. And it's just... You know, that's just the way it works for these things, especially in the Trek franchise, because, you know, you can do roles based if you're doing heavy makeup, you know, you can do another part and doing something different. And he did bring me back. I was uh, I basically was myself, except for the Klingon role. I was recognizable all the way through to Voyager. And yeah, uh, which is which is quite awesome, because your your role as Tuvok became so iconic that then they kind of retconned all your other appearances in Star Trek to almost be like the, you know, Tuvok was around this entire sort of timeline. So they almost like yeah. reverse engineered your history based on characters that were not obviously, you know, a, a Vulcan when, when yeah. you first portrayed them, but yeah. then eventually became Vulcans in retrospect because your uh, sort of interpretation of Tuvok is such an iconic part of Star Trek. Like I, I as a fan, I'd love to know when you first read uh, Tuvok. Like, what were some of your earliest thoughts and your in your earliest in, like introduction to the character? Was it something that they brought you in to compete against some other actors? Were you already kind of thought about, you know, by the by the producers? Is like this is the guy. What was your early relationship with Tuvok like? The well, the, the the I when I was given the script to come in and uh, read for the role, that was the first time I mm. had any idea um, of, of what they were going to write for me, how they how they were going to write it, and you know, um, I knew how I was going to play it, but uh, they, it was it wasn't until I went in to read for this thing, uh, and I only read once um, for it, and that's it wasn't until then that I knew that uh, I was going to, you know, I, that I saw what they had put together mm. uh, for it. And it worked fine. The scene was good. You know, there was a, a juxtaposition of what he was, his character was versus a human character. So there was a little bit of that, you know, um, I, you know, I, I, I was already familiar with the way that the Vulcan character should be played. Sure. So I just played, you know, as, as close to that character as I could possibly get. And uh, and it worked out just fine. And I get, you know, again, Ber Rick Berman had told me, you know, months before that, that he was interested in having me come in and read for it. So I already knew that was going to happen mm. uh, beforehand. That's great. And, and the character is so interesting because, you know, um, the Vulcan 
um, before Tuvok, we always kind of looked at him as, you know, the science officer, you know, the kind of scientist in the crew. And what your Vulcan was, I think, far more interesting because he was the security officer. You know, he was the 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 law and order guy, like the sort of strict army guy on the ship. And he also had this incredibly gentle relationship with the captain, you know, like like yeah. the sort of deep friendship. So this yeah. dichotomy of being super, you know, like he is the boss when it comes to the security, right? And but he's also like the best friend, um, you know. And, and it's a, just a completely interesting curveball to the whole Vulcan thing, um, you know. And you know, you played it beautifully, but. How how did you start to sort of develop these two sides of the character? Well, you know, it, a lot of that's just based on the writing. Um, sure. I, I can't do anything without script. So right. they create the stories. They give me the backstory. They flesh out the character. And sometimes I'll put in a, a word or two or suggestion. Sure. You know, for a storyline or a change or whatever. And uh, they'll go along with it or they won't. And... Uh, and, 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 you know, that's all you can do because you're a hired hand. So you know, uh, it, 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 they, they flesh out the character over time. It took us nine episodes. You get all kinds of angles on this character. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, um, what, and was so, there a lot of improvising with, with like, like on the set of, of no, Star Trek or is it so very no, strict? No, no. Yeah. There's no improvising. Everything is very, very strict. You want to change a word. They will call it in from the soundstage to oh, the wow. to the producers, and they will give you a yes or a no. <laughs> and that's how that works. Yeah. Wow, I didn't realize always, that. <laughs> it is word perfect on that show. Right, right. Um, there's no playing around because the, the language is very specific. It's a certain style, and uh, and generally the rule is when you're you know when you're playing some alien character with a lot of crazy makeup on their face. You know, they have to sound, they have to use a classical sort of style of speech, a uh, formal style of speech mm -hmm. for those characters. And they're very specific about what they're saying because the audience watching this ridiculous looking, you know, mm -hmm. face with this crazy makeup on has to take them seriously. So if they sound casual, it's not going to work. You know, right. it's just not gonna, you're not gonna believe it. I can cite one example. I can cite one example and I don't want to, um, you know, I don't want to disparage uh, the actress because she's huge right now. But, um, but there's a feature film, a science fiction feature film that's out right now that just came out recently, uh, which is huge. Mm -hmm. It's a remake. And um, the actress in it is supposed to be a member of this alien sort of tribal culture on this planet. And she, when she, you know, everybody else is speaking in a way in which you would believe that they are an alien race, tribal race on a planet where she speaks. She sounds like she just, you know, walked out of the valley or out of the. Yeah, yeah. Out of the city, <laughs> of the city in Chicago or something, yeah. in New York. Without being too specific, I think I know exactly what you mean. And um, yeah, it, I didn't it, have to even say it, and you know, what I'm talking <laughs> about. and it stuck out like a sore thumb. I was like, "What in the world? Who was, you know, where was the director on that thing, man? That would sure. have been one note right there. This would have been just a simple note. Can you give me something a little more formal? And I'm pretty sure she's able to cut it i'm pretty sure she's able of to course. do it but but it wrecked this it wrecked the beat and she's on there for you know the second and third movies i'm sure quite a bit so when they do that again she's going to have a lot more dialogue and a lot more interaction a ton more interaction with the lead character and we, we, if she's going to do it that way it's just not going to be believable right. and that uh, that's that's what you mean by that's what i mean by the dialogue and language can't sound like, you know, you're at a coffee table at uh, Starbucks and uh, that's where they're shooting the scene today. And it just doesn't, it just doesn't fly. Yeah. Um, so it's not believable. And so that's what they, that's why they had such tight range 
as opposed to a soap opera or a cop show or some shit like that. You can get away with doing stuff like that. In terms of the makeup for Tuvok, that wasn't too intense, right? Because really all you really had was the eyebrows and 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 the ears, right? You didn't have much more than that. Um, no, that's it. Makeup that's it. is, yeah, it's 25 minutes. I was out of the chair. You know? 25 minutes, you that's know, it. And, and what they would put, they would put fake eyebrows on you to give it that kind yeah, of they, angle. Yeah, they lay, they lay in lace pieces. They hand lace uh, these pieces uh, every year. I get new ones and uh, they hand lay them and uh, they glue them on and we're all done. So it's very quick and easy. And did you get to keep some of the ears, obviously? I kept a few pairs that I'd worn, yeah. <laughs> right. I think I'd auctioned them off for charity or something at the time. Sure, sure, sure. Do, do you ever miss playing? Because I miss Tuvok a lot. And, you know, sure, you get some novels here and there. Um, but, you know, it's a character that was, you know, it it, it was a very important character to me. Um, and, and, you know, I was telling the story to Brandon uh, the other day. Um because when I was at NYU, we had a teacher come and do a program with us where, you know, they told us the stories about how Star Trek um, had this open sort of screenwriter process, you know, where people can like submit stories very famously back in the day. Mm -hmm. So as part, you know, so we had this assignment in school to uh, create our own Star Trek story, you know. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah. And anyway, that was the assignment. And that's that's how I got introduced uh, to Star Trek, because before that, I was like thinking about, you know, Antonioni and Igmar Bergman and Stanley Kubrick. And to me, Star Trek didn't really mean anything, you know, but I got introduced to Star Trek via a Voyager. And your character in particular is what sort of really sucked me in. And my script was actually based off of Tuvok. Um, and funny enough, my in in my story, Tuvok um, is, you know, like it's like a flash forward and Tuvok is a captain of a ship of a of a special kind of like security ship. Yeah. And his first officer is a hologram that he has this like, you know, sexual relationship with, um, which eventually you guys actually did some stuff like that, you know, where, where uh, you know, for the Pond Far, you know, Tuvok had that whole thing with, uh, with, you know, with him. But anyway, my point is, do you ever miss Tuvok? Like, it, it, like, do you ever get that sort of like need inside to sort of revisit him or like, you know, want to play him again and see where he is today or anything like that? Nope. Um, not really. <laughs> you know, you know, he, was a, he was a character that I played uh, years ago and sure, you sure. know, I don't have any desire to, uh, you know, to do him again. I mean, if I was asked to do it, I'd certainly consider it, but of course, of course, I don't think about it every day. No. Uh, you know, the thing about this business is, man, you're only as good as your next job. You have to keep moving Amen. forward. Amen. You got to keep moving forward, thinking and evolving and, uh, and doing other things, which I have been doing. So yeah, no, it's not, it's, you know, it was a, it was a gig back then and it sure. could, just as easily could have been Baywatch, you know? Right. Right. I mean, look, it, it's, I don't know if I agree that it could have easily has been Baywatch because Tuvok is such a, I mean, he's an icon, you know, he's such an incredible, uh, you know, character. He, he, you know, to me, he kind of carried that show a little bit because he gave that show a certain level of seriousness yeah. that like kept that show very interesting because, you know, he was a detective, you know, and like, I think my favorite episode of all of uh, sort of Tuvok lore and Brandon and I were actually trying to remember the name of the episode. We couldn't remember it. But it was an episode where Tuvok is investigating a crime on the ship. And it turns out that he's hunting himself. Um, and it's a very kind of Jorge Luis Borges, like labyrinthian yeah. Type, yeah. You know, detective story. Do you remember this episode? Nope. Um, <laughs> I don't. And I, I think I did. I did do in the first season. I think it was the first season. LeVar Burton directed one of the episodes where I investigated um something that happened to tom paris on an island on a on a planet yes he was yes. accused of a crime and i helped to solve the crime yeah yes, if yes. i recall if i recall i don't remember the name of it but that was a very cool episode because he shot it sort of in a noir style right. which i thought was really really well done uh, you know um but so um i i rem i you know uh i don't remember the one you're talking about but but those are, there would have been at least two episodes where there was sort of an investigative uh, sort of 
straight line for me to follow in the story. Right. And it was you were cool. the Sherlock Holmes of the, you know, like Sherlock of, Holmes. Yes. You yeah. know, and like that's a really cool angle to, you know, to give like a Vulcan, you know, like, you know, the Vulcan who's like the scientist always trying to figure stuff out. It makes sense. It makes yeah. total sense because if you're doing analytical um, you know, in, investigations, you're looking at facts and details and and li and uh, linear sort of things happening and cause and effect and evidentiary stuff or and and putting puzzles together it's a puzzle right and you know he's going to be pretty good at puzzle you know he's, oh, he's going to be awesome at puzzles yeah so it's uh it's very cool it's very yeah, cool. yeah. and um, what what was your relationship like with the cast you know because like on the show it seems like it was you know obviously you know it's television so it's all smoke and mirrors but from the show perspective it seems like you guys were actually very very tight and there's one episode where 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 you get I was just watching it in prep for this where you get um uh you know promoted and right before you get promoted like everybody in the crew is kind of sitting around you kind of roasting you you know very you know like like slightly but it but you know but it's all in very good humor and like it can, like the chemistry of that crew was to me absolutely incredible was it like that behind the scenes were you guys as tight as it seemed like in front of the cat like in front oh, of the yeah. camera. Oh yeah, we got along. We all That's got cool. along. We had a we had a you know, sometimes we got along too much. Um, <laughs> right. the directors and the, and the line producer, uh, you know, we're trying to get done with the scene before 13 or 14 hours are up. Um yeah, we uh, we got along fine. We joked around, kidded around and clowned around, you know, uh, more than once. Um, sure. and uh, and we got along just fine. And all of us, you know, we 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 We've all we every once in a while we do run into each other for um, uh, events and things like that uh, for con conventions and things and and we get a chance to see each other and it's always very warm very friendly we we got along with everybody it was just it was I was very lucky mm. to have that because most of us are we're veterans on that show you know sure. I mean the youngest person was Garrett um, he, he had not been on a series prior to that but we were all on shows we were all on right. series and features and all kinds of stuff so by the time we get there we know what the game is we know how it works we know what we have to do and we go and do it and we go home and that's mm. that's what it was that's how lucky uh i was on that show to not have to work to deal with god i don't know prima donnas or uh, attitude right. everybody had a place man everybody knew what they had to do every we shared because it's a big ensemble it's nine of us and we right. shared we shared everything on there, and it was uh, it was great, and it was a very cool thing. And you know, now things must be a little bit. Uh, you know, hopefully things are going to get back you know on track. But um, you know, I've been to a bunch of Star Trek uh, you know conventions in my time, um, and like I know what a critical part that was for the crew to sort of a you know have this relationship. Uh, with the fans, you know, this kind of ongoing yearly time to meet up with the fans, but also, you know, that the Star Trek conventions were also like sort of added um, revenue for you guys, right? It was a way to, you know, for you guys to maintain a little bit of money here and there from that. Has it sucked not being able to do that or is that kind of back on track? I can't remember if I saw you at the last one that I went to like years ago. Um, but were you a part of those conventions? Is that something that uh, is back, you know, to to uh, to uh, being back on track, or is that still yeah, kind of yeah. off? Yeah, yeah, the cons are still going. They're right. You know, there there was there was only going to be a temporary respite from all that because of COVID. But yeah, we're still doing them. I have to go out of town. I have to do one oh, this weekend, and uh -oh. I, I've done a couple in the last couple of months. So they're still going. Um, and do you enjoy them or do you find them a little bit like of a headache or do you actually enjoy sitting down with the fans and like seeing how much love you bring to these people's hearts? Well, you know, the, the, I can, I very much appreciate the fans uh, enthusiasm and their loyalty, their uh, yeah, yeah. dedication to it and their appreciation for what, what, what we did as a cast on the show and, or, or whether they got a, a, something out of my character, because when you're doing it, of course, you're not thinking about all that. But sure. But the after effects and the the, the fallout from all that is can be very, very positive. It can be very, very inspiring, um, and 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 surprising in some cases. But um, but yeah, I mean, the process of doing the conventions, yeah, that's just you know, it's kind of a a work. It's a gig because you have to 
you know, it's a, there's a lot of repetition in, 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 a, in a day's worth of that uh, kind of work. And it just becomes repetitious. So um, because there's so many people, some of those shows are really big and uh and and there's a lot of hours and a lot of times i'm fairly tired when i'm doing them because i've had to travel so <clears throat> so it's 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 a bit of a schlep to do uh, the right, right. Yeah. and, and uh, with uh with star trek i know that you got to direct um at least one episode that i know about uh, living witness um what, what what was that experience like of, of getting to like step behind the camera and actually direct a little star trek it was very cool. I mean, it, uh, it was a long process. We had to learn, we had to intern on the show for a couple of years to, uh, behind the scenes to get familiar with the whole process. And then, um, and then we got to, uh, when I got to work on the show, it was, it was great because I mean, you know, had, you know, directing one of those episodes and that was a fairly expensive episode uh, mm. because they built a really big set for that episode, which they used later on. And they used in a movie that they were shooting later on. And uh, for me to be able to do that, and I, the producer, the producers never came down to the set to stand over me to see what I was doing. They just right, they just kind of let you do it. They thing. Just let me do it, and sure enough, I was able to make it happen. I mean, it was able. Uh, the actors came in prepared. They delivered their their material and their scenes perfectly, um, because they're, of course they're all pro, and. Um, and I was really thrilled to see what they did because they had to play the dark versions of themselves. And we had never done that before. Mm. So I was very lucky to get that script because you can't pick the scripts. They just give them to you. Right, so right. I was very lucky to get that script with a great story. And Bob Picardo is a lead actor and did a great job, of course. And a great, a great concept, a great, a great moral, a great moral play and, and a, a difficult character decisions as, as it typically is with Star Trek. And, and uh, a wonderful, b b a great big new set that they built that I get to, got to work on. And uh, everything went very, very smoothly. I'm very proud of that episode and how it turned out. I loved That's cool. everything about it. It was just great. Yeah, yeah, it's a good episode. It's, you know, for the folks that are listening, it's the episode where um, it's like many, 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 many years in the future. And it's like a museum um, where, where um, you know, Voyager is sort of being talked about in this like very like uh, wrong historical context. Yes, yes. And the doctor gets sort of turned back on as like a first, you know, like you know, like a like a first eyewitness of, right. of what actually happened. So it's kind of mm -hmm. has a little bit of that Rashomon effect. Um, yes, you know, um, it's a it's a it's a revisionist history story. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Where the history is not, you know, the history is told uh, is not told correctly. Um, it, it, it demonizes a, a segment of that society. And as a result, that society is treated as second class citizens, uh, you know, as, as punishment um, for decades or, or centuries after that, when, you know, in fact, they were not responsible for what happened. And the story is completely false and erroneous. And that's, you know, and the exposing of that becomes a huge, huge risk for their society. Uh, but needs to be done. So there, there's um, I'm trying to see if I can if I can find the name here, but there was a a a fan film um, that one of my you know somebody that used to work um, uh, for me at my last studio. Um, his name is Rob Meyer Burnett. Does that name ring a bell? No, you? Uh, no. So so he he put together like a very big uh, fan film. This is years ago. Mm -hmm. And you were the lead uh, star of that fan film. Um, does that does that ring a bell? Uh, the lead star as playing what character? I, I believe you were like the um, the main uh, captain. Um, mm -hmm. It was it was like a Star Trek fan film. Anyway, it's all good. I I I, I can't remember the name of it. I don't. Yeah, I don't remember that one. I think the only. Uh, let's see. The only Trek project that I worked on was Renegades. I directed that one, but I don't remember playing the lead character in another. And Renegades. Tell me a little bit about that one. Which one was that? Renegades. We shot. Um, I don't remember the year, um, but it was um, produced by Sky Conway. They uh, we shot with uh, Adrian Wilkinson. Uh, we had uh, a whole bunch of different actors. Manu was in it. 
Um, Ethan Phillips was, I think Ethan was in that as well. It might have been Gods and Men for Ethan. I don't think he was in Renegades. Mm. Um, and uh, and a few other actors who were at, were prominently featured in that project. Um, Sean Young was in it. Bob Picardo was in it. Um, it was that a, was a fan film, right? It was a this was, yeah. This was initially actually it was a pilot presentation. It was shot as a presentation to before all the other series rebooted that they have on now. Sure. It was, it was done as a pitch to pitch to Paramount. Oh wow! So it was it was a basically a pilot presentation. It was intended for that, um, and they didn't you know bite on it. So that it, it eventually was just uh, the producer just released it you know uh, along with as for free as along with another film that he made as just part of the purchase. So he um, Renegades was very cool. It was an original story. Um, it was the, a lot of so serious bad guys that they had in it, some bad aliens. And <laughs> right. We had to take them out. And Renegades was supposed to be a new vamped version of Star Trek with a, almost like a pirate type crew. Mm. Uh, these guys are criminals. They're being chased by the Federation for crimes. And then they're, they're employed, hired to eventually to do these specific jobs but in renegades they just come together arbitrarily to try to deal with this threat that's on the horizon and they successfully do and uh walter koenig is in it um and it worked out just fine it was a really interesting piece i liked it we did also one called gods and men earlier than that mm. gods and men is i think even a better story than Renegades. I think it's a very strong story. Nichelle Nichols is in it. Walter's in it. There's a, Alan Ruck is in it. There's a whole bunch of folks in that one. Uh, Garrett is in it. So if you look at Star Trek of Gods and Men, it's all of those are online. I think they're on YouTube. Uh, Star Trek of Gods and Men and Star Trek Renegades. Uh, Gods and Men is wonderful. Um, oh, I'm going to check that out. I haven't seen that one. Oh, dude, you got to check that out. That's, that's a good story. Um, and we we brought back a couple of characters from the original episode, or the original series. Mm. Uh, a couple of those characters are in Star Trek of Gods and Men, and they're tied into uh, the story. And we also use the gate as a device, the, mm. the, gate, the dimensional gate. We yeah. use the gate, the portal, as, as a device to, to launch the story. So that's cool. very cool. Yeah, very cool. We have the original interior of the uh, enterprise we have the original uh, transporter you know platforms we have the engineer we have all the stuff in there that was in the original a lot of that was in the original series because we had those sets sure and so we uh so this story takes place on the original enterprise mm. the original ship so uh that kirk was that was playing so in this case alan ruck is the captain of that ship and uh it's a lot of fun. And that's that cool. A lot of fun. I'm in it as Tuvok. Uh, like I said, Nichelle is in it. Um, and it's an alternate universe story. It's very cool. Oh, I see. And, and Renegades, uh, you're in it as Tuvok and you're directing it. Yeah, in it as Tuvok and directed it, yes. That's cool. And is yeah. that feature length? Is uh, Renegades feature length? Renegades is almost feature length. It's 70 minutes. I think oh, 70 minutes. Okay, cool. Minutes. Yeah. So like a long episode. It would have been a long episode, yes. That's cool. That's cool. Yeah. Now this has been, this has been a lot of fun. And so, so what kind of stuff are you up to now? I know that you've done an episode of the Orville. Um, you came in there and uh, you know, the Orville is great. I haven't finished watching it, but it's amazing how similar to Star Trek it is right from like a soul perspective. Sure. I mean, you know, um, because Seth is a huge, huge Star Trek fan and yeah. always has been. And that was his intention to put this, to put a little bit of humor and uh, satire a little bit into the uh, series to make it a little different from, you know, all the shows that are out there. And uh, at the same time, they do some serious themes on that show as well. Yeah. Um, but yeah, Doraville, it did American Horror Story. It did um, uh, the 4400 uh, recently. Um, I did an NCIS. I did, I've done a whole bunch of stuff in the- Yeah, in about three or four, Yeah, three or four independent films that I just appeared in. A uh, series called Classified, which is a comedy satire about the intelligence agencies, which is a pilot, mm. and um, a bunch of stuff uh, between uh, a couple of Christmas shows, a couple of 
I want to say Christmas type lifetime shows. I've done a couple of those. That's cool. Um, and um, and also working on three, uh, three of my own projects with different producers, all different producers and writers. Where you're directing uh, and acting? I would, I would be directing, not acting. And I'm also directing, set to direct a, a supernatural thriller this fall. Um, I think in September. And, uh, and what 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 kind of muscles in your brain do you feel like you need to train differently as a director versus an actor? Like now that you've done so much directing and so much acting, like how do you kind of distinguish the two disciplines? Um, well, it's it, 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 you know, as an actor, you only are. You're only uh, part of the canvas. You're just one of the colors on the canvas. As a director, you have to look at the entire canvas and you're, in, you're sort of in charge of and sort of working the entire canvas. So you have to take this material that's on the page and you have to figure out how you're gonna interpret that visually. And that is actually a lot of work. That's a lot of heavy lifting because right. you can interpret some things a dozen different ways. And you have to come up with an overall tone, an arc, a tone, um, for the whole piece, you have to feel how is this going to look? What's the texture of the film going to be like? What is the pace of the film going to be like? What type of coverage is going to be? Is the camera going to be busy or is it going to be more stable and the actors are going to take over? What is the genre of the pic the picture? Because if it's horror, you got to style it, you got to do it that way. Mm. If it's, you know, uh, if it's a, a soap opera type piece of drama, straight drama, and then a certain style. There's, if it's going to be a psychological thriller, it's going to have a certain style. If it's an action piece, there's certain things you've got to come in with in terms of that. So, uh, and if it's science fiction, you've got, you know, definitely some stuff going on there. Um, so that you have to, all those things have to be taken into account. And each, each project is its own, its own entity, its own beast. It has its own set of, do you like to storyboard? Is that part of your process? Are you big into the storyboarding? Are you more into like working with the DP and sort of letting him run a little bit? Like, yeah, if I was to uh, thus far, I haven't done that much storyboarding. I'm doing storyboarding now on a sci fi picture, mm. which would be really big if once he gets it off the ground, this producer gets off the ground. We are storyboarding, storyboarding that, yes, because mm. um, it's pretty intense, There's a lot of stuff going on. So um, the other one, I don't know if I'm going to storyboard the project that's in September. I would work with the DP either way, either way, storyboard or not, you work with the DP very closely to come up with some, some, uh, with, with the whole project. And so it depends for me, it depends on the size mm -hmm. and scope of the project, how much prep time I'm going to have, uh, with the DP coming up with all that stuff. It just takes time to storyboard the entire project. Uh, you also have to have your locations locked down and all that good stuff prior to storyboarding because you, if you don't have the location, if you don't know what the set is going to be like, you, you, right. it's hard to storyboard it. But you certainly can work uh, on your own and with the DP to get an idea of how you want to cover a particular scene, um, how you want to transition out of that scene, how you want to transition into that scene. Um and how you want, to, and, and basically how you want to cover the, the the arc of the scene, how you're going to show it coming, you know, how it plays out. And is, are there special effects in the scene? Is there post stuff that has to be done? Well, we have to prep for post. Is there green screen? Is there CGI? Sure. Is there an object that's floating across the room? We all have to, all that's got to be, all that stuff has to be done. If somebody disappear, somebody up here, mm. all <laughs> that has to be, somebody has to, all that has to be worked out prior to shooting so yeah there's some footwork that goes into that stuff depending upon on the genre of the film and um what what's your approach like directing actors because like you know like even at nyu and throughout my career like you know working with actors is seems like it's different for every single actor i've ever worked with you know like you have to have a like a slightly different approach you know like my old film school teacher used to tell me it's like a pit you know it's like a coach walking up and talking to a pitcher, you know, it's like, sometimes you got to scream at the pitcher. Sometimes you got to like support the pitcher, you know, yeah. like how, how, what, what's your kind of approach in, in working with actors? Uh, generally uh, doing the homework ahead of time is the best thing is to who you're going to cast because mm. the better, the actor that you cast is perfectly <clears> good, <throat> that means a lot less work on the set. The okay. actor's got to be right for the role. They got to have the personality, the walk and talk, as I call it. Uh, for that role, you know, and if they're supposed to be a real snotty, 
you know, uptight uh, receptionist, then they got to have that attitude and that personality coming in. They mm -hmm. don't have to work on it. If they're mm -hmm. supposed to be the sweet little innocent wallflower, they got to have that face, an angelic face, a personality, a beautiful smile, whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. All those things come into play. So the physical type and the personality, walk and talk of the actor, you know, give you a whole long lead of, 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 uh, of homework that's done prior to getting them on the set. They do have to have the chops and the skills to deliver those scenes. So you're, you're going to read most of your actors, unless it's somebody who's, already an established name and or somebody that you've worked with already. If right. they're an established name, you know, you're, you're putting them in the role because they're an established name and you already know that they're right for that role. You're not going to go to somebody who's not right for that role. You can look at them and tell, Oh, they've done this. They've done that. Yeah. They'd be right for this role. Right. And they come in. And then if it's a, if it's a role that's, I want to say generic, but say like a, a romantic lead or a, uh, or a straight, like a lawyer, doctor, whatever it might be, then that actor is going to play, you know, the way that they normally play, unless there's something really eccentric about that character. If they're able to nail the eccentricities, great. And if not, you know, whatever. But but otherwise, if you want somebody who's really odd mm. or eccentric or, you know, bizarre in terms of their physical look and their and the way that they behave, if they're able to walk in and, you know, do a read like that and it's spot on, then you hire that person. Mm. Um then you, when you get on the set, all you have to do is say action and, you know, uh, funnier, faster, smaller, bigger. I mean, all you have to do is, you know, uh, go through those scenes. And, and if they're laying it down, I don't get that many takes. I don't like to wear it out. Interesting. But you know, what I will do is I will say, you know, you know, I might say if it's a, if it's a tricky stuff, it's got, if the scene's got nuances and it's stuff, the stuff is a little tricky in terms of the, the transitions and the sh gear shifts in the in the dialogue, I might say, "Get well, try this one with a longer pause, mm. or hold before you start the line, or hold after you say them. Just hold it in the middle. Give me a long beat between this, or try it like that with that attitude, and try it with this attitude, and then you've got a variety. And the actor may want to do another take just for themselves. So, so you have stuff you can play with, you know, right. uh, in post and editing." And at the same time, you don't wear the scene out. But at least the actors, if you do it right up front, you shouldn't have a problem when you mm -hmm. get on the set. Um, if you don't do it right, well, then you got a problem. Yeah. So, yeah, no, that, that's a really interesting piece of advice. But so basically you're saying that um, do as much of the directing and the casting as possible. Like, yeah. Like really yeah. do your homework on the casting. Do the homework on the casting. And when you get on the set, if the actor is really talented and they want to improvise or try some things. Well, then, yeah, you 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 let them uh, let them work, see what they come up with, because it could be really cool. That's and cool. Uh, and it makes total sense to let them, you know, expand and explore and do whatever. If you have time, you know, some projects I've had, there wasn't a lot of time. I just had to shoot the stuff and get out of there. So they basically just did the shot and we moved. But if you have the time to work the scene and it's a tricky scene, it's a complicated scene then yeah, you want to take time to, to let the actor explore it and, and try it this way and try it that way and see how it comes together. Um, it, it's really a miracle that any of this stuff ever gets made. In the first <laughs> right. you know, right. Given the number of people involved in the loop, you know? Sure. And, and look, uh, first of all, thank you so much for your time. You've been so yeah. generous. Uh, there's one question I have to ask because I've seen pictures of you online but i've never actually seen you performing you're also a musician yes i am yeah i've been a musician for 45 years at least um, wow. and um you know I, I used to make a living at it at one point but now i just do it because i enjoy it and um it can come in handy on occasion because of sure, the timing and you're, you're uh, a guitar yeah. player yeah, guitar player and vocalist. And it, it also, I've also booked gigs because I could play. So that's awesome. You know, acting gigs. And that's pretty cool. Uh, I would not have been able to do that if I hadn't been playing consistently. So I still perform live. I got my own band. We're going to be in the Long Beach Blues Festival coming up in September this year. Oh, nice. Is it blues music? Is that primarily what you play? Like yeah, it's, it's some blues. And I want to say some blues, some roots music, you would call it old school, classic rock style of stuff. Mm -hmm. It's not, uh, it's not prog rock. It's not, um, 
uh, anything you'd alternative. It's, it's not anything you'd have to, you know, scratch your head over. Um, you get it when you hear it. It's nothing, <laughs> nothing, nothing complicated or tricky. Oh, you I gotta can, hear it. Can, I gotta you hear can, it. You can tap your foot to it. Um, is there so, any links that I can leave, um, like on the, uh, on yeah. the podcast and the video just so yeah, people can go check it out? Yeah, you can, you can, if, if people type, type in, you know, uh, Tim Russ crew, Tim Russ crew, C R E W Tim Russ crew on YouTube. We've got clips on there and on my website, I've got a couple of links to the band's demo, um, where it's got a, a smattering of different songs and a live performance, all live performance. Um, I also have on my site, I'm pretty sure I have the, uh, the link to a music video of my own material, a song called We, mm -hmm. and also a song called Lead Me Home. That's an old standard. Um, and I've got, so I've got two music videos, very different from each other, I can tell you that. But We, <laughs> we uh, is the song that you would appreciate. Uh, That's cool. Because it's a, it's a satire. Mm. um about the state of you know the state of affairs with people in uh big giant corporations and businesses uh, where you're nothing more than a number so it's sure it's uh it has to do with communications in a sense um and uh so that's called we and that's on pretty sure it's on my website as well um but it's also on youtube if you type in we tim russ that music video will come up uh, the webpage is timrusswebpage.com. If you just type my name in, you're going to get my webpage on Google, right? That's cool. So and and uh, do yeah. you play every day or like once a week? I try, to play, I try to play at least every other day. That's awesome. Um, sometimes I'm working on new stuff and, and, uh, and, and sometimes just to practice, just to play and practice because you do have to do that. You know, it, uh, oh, oh, I know it. Trust me. I am. Yeah. Um, I haven't played like in two, three weeks because I actually just recently finally got COVID for the first time. Uh -oh. First of all, it was a lot worse than I thought it was going to be. Uh oh. Uh, yeah. <laughs> nice. That's not yeah, good. Yeah, it sucked. And I haven't played in a while. And like, you know, the calluses on your fingers start to go away. And, Correct. You know, oh, wait. Correct. Oh, my uh, camera just. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, like I got all my guitars back there. And like, you know, I feel like they get lonely when you don't actually use them. You know? Yeah, you've got a rack of them I can see back there. Yeah. Oh yeah, man. I, I love your, my guitars. What do you play? What do you play mostly? Which I play, play um I play mostly um like you know, I also have a band, you know, sort of singer yeah. songwriter stuff, like right. kind of like you know, Beatles, Bob Dylan, okay. political political satire type stuff. But when I practice, I tend to just like you know pick a blues thing and like a minor and then just improvise over that for like exactly time. exactly yeah i played yeah. a I played a different songs um the, you know whichever i like on you might hear something and just play along with them if they're tricky and got some crazy stuff going on them i'll play along with those and i also play bass as well so i'll do the same thing with the bass guitar that's awesome what, what guitars do you have when you have it? so i have um so uh I got this one. This one actually I love. This is kind of like my my um, my sort of acoustic. It's it's by a company called Orange Wood. Okay. It's actually, actually based in California, based in Santa Monica. Right. And uh, it's an all solid wood guitar. Wow. So, so typically this these guitars by like a big brand would go for like I don't know two thousand dollars. Yeah. But this is the same exact wood, solid wood, really nice handling. Like seven hundred bucks, you know. Wow! But it's wow. really, man. It's a really, really nice. You know, I'm not gonna start jamming in front of you, but it's a yeah. really nice guitar. Excellent. And and then I have my, uh, you know, my uh, Gibson Les Paul back there. Right. And um, on this side, I have my, uh, you know, Fender Strat. Right. I have uh, my Rickenbacker, a Gibson Jumbo back there. Got it. Yeah, just like a bunch of guitars, you know. <laughs> oh, excellent. You know I, how it is. Yeah, I, I, mean, know I love exactly, it. I know exactly how it is. I I definitely put a lid on how many I would get because uh, <laughs> right. I, I'd have a house full by now. But um, I know I, there's I, something I, about guitars you just want to buy more, right? Yeah, you just want to. I've traded them out on numerous occasions, and uh, my girlfriend always says, "Oh my God, you didn't trade another one, did you?" Yeah, I did. Um, <laughs> I have. Uh, I have. Uh, 
I've gone through a few. I used to have a Strat for a really long time, and I do love. Generally, I love Strats. I love Fender in in general, and yeah. uh, I love the Strat body cut. Sure. I really like that cut, and so I've got. I've got an Ibanez right now that I really like. It's beautiful sound, beautiful tone. Well, Ibanez electric with a Strat body cut, mm. um, but it's got it's got humbucker pickups. It's just smooth as silk. Oh, and awesome. I've got uh, a brand new PRS that I bought. Oh, those uh, are very nice. Those are very yeah, nice. Yeah, sweet, real sweet. Great action, great neck, great sound. So I've got a PRS, which is not a Strat body cut, but it's uh, but it's got a nice feel. Nice. Is it the twenty four uh, twenty four fret one? Yeah, it's a C. It's a CE, not the not the SE. It's the CE. It's a higher C-E. end, a higher end one. Yeah, it's a beautiful, beautiful uh, body, beautiful color, beautiful body cut, and it's a simple um, tone and volume controls with a with a uh, pickup switch. And I've got a the third one I've got, which is more based on the uh, Leo Fender guys. It's a GNL Legacy, which is you know the guys that built Fender guitars, basically the designer sure. and the guitars. GNL Legacy, which is a blonde uh, color, beautiful, heavy son of a bitch. But it, that thing is just wonderful. Sounds great. Right. And, uh, and I play that often as well. So I be, rotate between all three of them. Yeah, that's cool. What I feel like that day. And they're this wonderful one, guitars. This one I, I, I tried to custom build. And I still haven't gotten it to work properly. Yeah. But I, but I love the kind of look for it. And, you know, like I put all the parts together myself. Yeah, uh, but I still haven't gotten the action to really work yet. But yeah, like I'm trying to come up with my own sort of design style. But wow, yeah. nice. Yeah. yeah, I love guitars, man. I'm a I'm a junkie. I'm a junkie for guitars. But yeah, uh, man. Yeah. Tim, maybe I, one day we can jam, man. Maybe one one of these stranger things have happened. Stranger, definitely stranger <laughs> things have happened. Yeah, don't don't say it can't happen. Yeah. yeah, Tim, man, this has been such an honor for me. Very good. Um, I got to tell you, man, since I've been a young kid at NYU, I've been looking up to your work and to finally get a chance to chat with you is truly an honor, man. So I I really appreciate you taking the time out. Yeah, no worries, my friend. Uh, my pleasure. Have a good one. Cool. Take his care, name is everybody. Tim Russ. Check him out online. Check out all his incredible work. Check out his website. And I'm going to go check out your band. Yeah, check out the band. Check out, check out the music video, We, and, um, and then the live links for the band. You'll see what I, you know. And those, I mean, those aren't, We've we've added more songs to our sets than are on the on the video. Obviously, I just picked out a couple of choice pieces and cool, it's all man. there. True, It'll say true death. Renaissance man, Tim Russ, actor, director, and musician. Thank you, thank you very much. Cheers, Take care. sir. Thank, thank you very much. Bye bye now.